The stories we tell ourselves matter. The images we consume matter. Cinema should reflect us all. Those words by filmmaker Ava DuVernay speak to the mission of the March on Washington Film Festival and our annual three-part workshop series, Minding Your Movie Business. We're here to pass on the wisdom of filmed entertainment professionals to those of you who are learning the ropes of the business. So welcome, I'm Isis Sara Bay, Artistic Director of the March on Washington Film Festival. Our topic is what's my distribution strategy, streaming versus theatrical releasing. And with us today is a prolific award-winning filmmaker and educator. We were excited and proud to screen her 2020 documentary, The Sit-In, Harry Belafonte hosts The Tonight Show in our festival three years ago. Her newest film, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, just debuted on Peacock. Her work has been featured on PBS, The New York Times Op Doc, Frontline Digital, The Cut, and The Smithsonian Channel. She is the founding director of the documentary program at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at the City University of New York. Please welcome Yoruba Richin. Hey, sis. Hi, how are you? Very well, thank you. So let's start with a little bit of background. How did you get started in filmmaking? What was your training and what inspired you? So um, let's see, I came to documentary filmmaking a little um, uh, circuitously. I um, actually have a background in theater. I grew up in, um, in New York. My mom was a playwright. I did lots of theater. I went to performing arts high school uh, in the city and then in college did lots of theater. And um, it wasn't until, but I'd always loved documentary, always you know, had watched documentary, which at that point would you'd really see just on, on PBS. Um, and uh, it wasn't until after I graduated that I um, had a friend and we, who had video experience, I actually had no, uh, no, no experience. Um, we had, we made a, made a, a short video for a class. And, um, you know, it was at that point that the cameras started getting smaller. They were, um, they were called uh, consumer cameras at that point. Mm -hmm. And um, they just felt more accessible. The technology was more accessible. And uh, we made this video about um, a cha policy changes in welfare that were happening at the time and really looking at how this is going to affect a African American community uh, in San Francisco, where I was, where I was, and it just was something that clicked. I, 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 you know, I remember I didn't know, you know, again, I had no experience. We were just out there doing it, and I remember editing, um, you know, editing the piece, and it was really a moment of wow. This really brings together my love of storytelling, my um, social, you know, instinct um, yeah. uh, and, 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 you know, going out and talking to people and interviewing people and research. So it really brought together all of my things that, you know, the things are, you love to do. excite yeah. me. Yeah. So um, I kind of never looked back after that. I did another video um, 
uh, that the next year, and I decided I was going to um, go back to New York. I was in California at the time, and I decided I was going to go back to New York and um, try to pursue this. And um, my first job, luckily, you know, gratefully, was with the 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 great Saint Clair Bourne, um, who yeah. was an amazing documentary yeah. filmmaker, pioneering, and an amazing mentor. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, that was my first job. And, you know, I moved over to the new size for a little bit in the early 2000s, um, but then embarked on making my, my first film. Um, and, you know. Yeah, we seem to have some of those things in common. I was a theater undergraduate major as well. And I worked in California for a while. I was a TV news producer as well. So we have a lot of things that seem to push us yes. along the lines of film and entertainment. So as a network news producer, and you're also a writer and producer, how have those skills helped you as a film director? Yeah, I actually think my time at ABC News, I was there for four years. I was uh, in the um, investigative unit. And the thing that was really good about that experience is that um, we were producing news uh, news um, stories for all of the all of the platforms. So everything, you know, from from Good Morning America to Nightline. So we had we did different lengths, you know, from two minute spots to uh, longer to, you know, uh, probably the longest were, were, were like the 20, the 2020 and the, and the nightline spots. And so that was really good because it gave me that experience. I also um, got experience in terms of writing um, because you have to script write when you are working yeah. in television news. You don't do that so much in documentary film, but uh, being able to, you know, think, you know, very early on of what the structure is of the program and what the structure is going to be of the piece um, is really important. And I got to work with um, editors and and cinema and DPs uh, mm -hmm. on these stories. Uh, and because it's you know news, you're doing it constantly. Whereas you know, as you know, sometimes it can take many years to make your first mm -hmm. film. So yeah. it was a lot of uh, great experience in, and also in research, um, in pitching stories, uh, and also learning from from people. I really soaked up uh, my, you know, the the experience of my colleagues. Um, soaked up their experience working with them. I started off as an AP, um, you know, associate producer, and um, and just and they had, you know, they had much more experience in journalism. So uh, that was all really important in terms of uh, making documentary films. And then in terms of writing, I always um, tell my students and uh, really emphasize that honing your writing skills is very important in filmmaking. Um, you know, oftentimes the first thing that you see yourself as a filmmaker and certainly uh, the other people see, whether they be, you know, uh, you'd be writing for grant, you're writing for grants or, um, or you know what have you, that uh, you are writing your film out on paper at first. Yeah. Um, you know you are putting down your ideas, your thoughts, um, and then you know putting it together in some kind of structure on paper. Um, and that is what you have to do for you know for grant writing um, and for people right. to uh, get a sense and understanding of what your ideas and the, the writing should be sharp. It should be, um, you know, it should be visual. It should be clear. Um, so writing is a, a very important skill in terms of filmmaking. Extremely. Film. And I can see how that news piece of not just writing in a crisp way, in a clear way, and it tells the pictures, but being able to do it quickly and making sure you tell the whole story in a short amount of time. So you talked about writing things out. How is that the same or different from storyboarding in narrative films? Yeah, it is different. Um, my process is, you know, I am usually writing things out even possibly before I'm shooting um, or even very, very early uh, in the shoot. And that's usually because of, you know, as I said, grant writing or, um, or, you know, again, for, <clears throat> excuse me, for your own purposes to uh, get your ideas down, put it in some kind of structure. And then after you 
you know, are shooting or have shot at least most of, you know, your film, then um, you embark on the process of storyboarding when you know what you have. So um, I'm about to do that for a film um, that I, you know, shot last year and the editor has been looking through the footage and, um, you know, we figuring out, initially, um, actually before she started looking through the footage, I wrote like a treatment of, Um, the film could be, you know, and then um, she started looking through uh, with, you know, with my treatment, started looking through the footage and now we're going to come together and putting together, um, you know, assemblies Mm -hmm. and now we're going to come together and, and storyboard um, the, the film. I see. So let me get this process straight. So you uh, think of your topic, you do the research, you write it out what you think is going to be kind of like a treatment, make it clear. Yeah. And you usually have to do that for, again, if there's funding that you're trying to, yeah. to get. And then uh, I guess the second part now storyboarding it, because you said the editor looked at the footage. It depends on what you get when you shoot. Exactly. You, know, you so, might want something, but not get something to reinforce it. Right. Which is why you wait to do the storyboarding because you right. see, and then the storyboarding is, you know, a process that happens up until the end. Yeah. Uh, you do an initial one, then you change it and you move it and you see what's working and what's not working. So before we move from the preparatory stage, in a sense, a lot of our viewers are filmmaking students. So what would you encourage them to do while they are in training? You mentioned the importance of writing and of researching. Anything else they should be thinking about now while they're training? Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know if they're just documentary students or narrative as well. And I guess it's it, 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 this goes for both. Um, or they want to do both, which many people do. Yeah. Um, one thing is to figure out, to 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 figure out what it is you like to do, which aspect of the, um, which aspect of the process. There's some people uh, who, you know, decide I want to be cinematographers or I want to be editors or I want to be producers. Um, And uh, it's good to figure that out, like what it is that you like or where you want to go into and really hone that skill, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, for DPs and for editors, they're always in demand. So, they're always, you know, you can get hired uh, by, you know, when you, when you, um, you know, when you focus on, mm-hmm. on that. For, um, for, I would also say as students, you know, really um, the, 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 the friendships and the networks that you make in school uh, with your fellow with your fellow students, with professors are really important. I mean, this is a, field where it's really about networking and it's about who you know. So those are very important, um, you know, relationships. To, Absolutely. To because they may, they'll probably be the people you're working with for the rest of your career. Exactly. Or they'll be in a position to hire you, yes. uh, or fund you or, or fund you. Absolutely. And then I would also say, you know, really take advantage of, there's so many film festivals out there. There's so many, you know, um, there's so many opportunities uh, now online as well to mm-hmm. network. Um, so I would really encourage students to take advantage of, of those and see what, um, you know, see what networks there are in your community. Um, places where you can go to show cuts and get feedback, to network, to um, look for jobs, all of that. So you just talked about attending film festivals. Sh- are you, you were talking about that in terms of places to see examples of work and to network. So I'm assuming people shouldn't wait until they have something to show to go to a film festival. No, not at all. Uh, there's um, so many festivals, or, you know, from hyper local to uh, national fe- festivals that are all around the country. And it's a great opportunity to see what is out there, to see films that are coming out. Um, and most of these festivals will hold, you know, panels or talkbacks or, you know, uh, educational, um, you know, specific educational panels. So I would definitely recommend taking advantage of those. Excellent. So as I mentioned earlier, we were able a, a few years back to show 
the sit-in. Harry Belafonte hosts The Tonight Show, which I absolutely loved because it was such a powerful point in history this week that he subbed for Johnny Carson and all of the people he brought on that week, powerful folks who don't usually get on television or didn't at that time. So this may take us back a bit to uh, how you put the process together, but we're gonna show the trailer. And then when we come back, I wanted you to just go through the key points again of your process when you were putting that together. And I would imagine research was very important in that as well. So let's just take a look at the trailer. From New York, The Tonight Show, starring Johnny Carson. And now, here's fabulous Harry Belafonte. Here he comes. Wait a minute. Harry Belafonte hosted a week of The Tonight Show? What? What? How did I not know this? Harry Belafonte takes an existing white institution and he turns it into something that represents his world. There are many sides to Harry Belafonte. Singer, actor, activist. Harry had an agenda and he had the people to back it up. What do you have in store for us this summer? I feel that we are in the midst of the most critical period in our nation. You see how pivotal this week was. That was the most revolutionary move that mainstream television could have done at the time. Good night. Thank you for being with us. Okay. So what are some of the key points of the process you just described from the selection of the topic through production for making a film like that? So this was an example of a film that um, where the uh, producers of the film were looking for a director um, to, to make this film. The film is based on or inspired by an article that was written by one of the producers, Joan Walsh, uh, in, the, in The Nation about this lost week. And they, um, the producers, Joan, and the executive producer, Joanne Reed, had an idea that had a idea that they wanted to turn this, that this could be a film, mm -hmm. that this was, you know, um, such a, you know, remarkable week that had been kind of lost to history. Um, and that could be a film. So the first thing that they did, even before bringing me on to see if it was a viable film, they knew they needed to have the participation of uh, Mr. Harry Belafonte. Yeah. And so that was the first step. So sometimes, you know, even before you, you know, can figure out anything, you, you know that you need, uh, you know, you know you need uh, the, uh, uh, the person to participate and yeah. need to have that access. People that have to be part yeah, of it. This is gonna be viable. So that was the first thing. Then, um, and then the other challenge with the, the uh, you know, with this film, and, and in conceiving of the film is that most of the footage had been lost from that week. Wow. So that was, you know, a very early on, okay, how are we gonna, you know, tackle this? But the producers came to me, um, we met, they told me about the week. I thought it was incredible. Something again, I'd never heard of, but wow, what a lineup from that week, right? Um, the fact that it was, you know, Dr. King's last, uh, interview, televised interview, Robert mm -hmm. Kennedy's, um, mm -hmm. one of his last interviews before he was assassinated. This was in 1968 as the world was, you know, yes. exploding. And Harry Belafonte was the, you know, nexus for, uh, for the civil the rights. Movement, side. Yes. And the civil the, rights. Entertainment. Yes. Um, you know, so it was just such a, a such a rich, a topic that I, you know, immediately said yes. And um, how we, uh, the process in um, making that film, first of all, was to bring in a team, uh, uh, you know, who we were gonna, who we wanted to, uh, to, to work with as producers and, and editors, um, because this is a team making sport, a <laughs> team making art. Uh, and so, you know, having, uh, people that you trust, people that you um, who you know can help you realize your vision um, of the film is so super important. So that was one of the first things I did is bring on uh, my editor, uh, and then we started um, 
going through. And then of course the archival person, like that is when you're making these mm -hmm. archival films, the, you have to have that person working from the beginning because you're telling this, you're telling this mostly through archive. Mm -hmm. So um, we started going through the archive, uh, seeing, you know, what was in terms of the people that were on the week. So there was the, the archive of, you know, of Harry Belafonte and then the people who were on the week on um, during that week, because we figured one of the ways that we were going to, you know, chiefly tell the story is because we didn't have the archive from the week, but through the archive of, there was so much great archive of people like Lena wow. Horn and Diane Carroll and uh, Zero Mostel and Paul Newman. And so we knew yeah. we had to tell the story that way. Um, but that's and, a lot of research. Yes, it's a lot of research, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we're also still haven't stopped looking to see if anybody out there has any footage or anything from that week. And I won't give this part away, but we did uh, find something kind of amazing. And that was literally, and that research involved like talking to people uh, who were, you know, who were in, um, you know, in, in the, um, you know, archivists, um, talking to people who had seen that week, who had, you know, who were viewers at that time, um, you know, really just, uh, you know, putting out on Facebook, uh, on social media, you know, so research involves, you know, all these different like ways to go, to go about it. And we did find some, some really cool, uh, you know, uh, some cool stuff. And then and I'll, that's all I say about that. You can watch the film on, on yes. TV. Yeah. Um, and then it was such a process really talk about storyboarding. We, you know, w went over and over and over, um, and of course, I'm sorry, we did the interviews with, uh, you know, Harry Belafonte, with we, you know, who other people that, you know, we thought would be great on screen, like Whoopi Goldberg, um, who remembered the week, and uh, mm -hmm. some people who are just regular people who remembered the week, mm -hmm. and then scholars of, uh, of music, um, who you know could talk about Aretha Franklin and her politics and why she would you know why Harry would want her on that week and um, uh, Dr. King uh, who when he was on at that time in 1968 was really kind of a very um, you know a very uh, not popular at that time he had just spoken true. about the Vietnam War he was. Uh, embarking on the poor people's campaign, the, the younger militants were criticizing him. So someone who could set, you know, the scene for that, um, you know, for that time period. Um, so, you know, figure out, and then of course his family, we interviewed Gina Belafonte. Um, so figuring out, you know, who those interviews are that you're gonna do that are gonna tell the story. Um, and then the structure, 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 like what is the structure? Um, and that was a constant, constant, and that's always, you know, the sort of most challenging part. Um, and we realized that we needed to tell uh, who Harry was and his significance. Absolutely. And we needed to, to open the film. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, you know, we went through what the week, uh, you know, who was on that week and their significance in terms of larger issues that were going on. Uh, and then the aftermath of that week mm -hmm. and what, you know, what happened um, after that. And then how do we bring it to why is this relevant to today? So the fact that we still, you know, that there's still very few people of color who are, um, you know, who are hosting late night, yep. um, very few women. And so that was, you know, uh, that was also what we wanted to include as well to make this historical uh, film relevant to contemporary audiences. So from the moment the producers approached you to when the film was done, how much time? Well, um, we started uh, in September of, um, I'm trying to remember, because we were supposed to premiere in um April of 2020 when the pandemic hit. Right. So, uh, you know, we had a, so I think we started in September of 2018. 
Mm-hmm. I think that's right. I'm just trying to remember. So actually, he- might have been, actually might have been, might have been really in earnest. Okay, in January of twenty of twenty eighteen. That's what it was. Yeah. January of twenty eighteen, and it took about. Um, you know, it took about maybe like nine months. Um, and then we were at, and then, you know, of course there's lulls as well, you know, people go, so it wasn't like it was, you know, straight as well. Uh, but by, uh, by, um, January or February of 2020, we knew we had gotten into Tribeca and so we were racing to finish and, um, we got to, we were like almost done. We got to like, um, we had an online, but we got to like the final, you know, the picture lock when we found out that Tribeca was going to be, can- that, you know, it was going to be canceled. So yes. then everything, obviously, you know, the beginning of the pandemic, yeah. no one knew what was going on. Um, but Peacock did pick it up. And, um, and then we had to finish over that summer by doing the online and the, 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 you know, the audio mix and all that. And it aired in September of 2020. Yes. And that's when we ran it in yes. September. I remember talking to you during this process and yeah. we're almost done. We're not done yet. Yeah. That's great. Exactly. Yeah. So this film, the rebellious life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, why did you pick her for a subject? So um, my, co-director of the film. I co-directed this film with uh, Joanna Hamilton and she had, um, she had connected with the author of a book. This is my second film that I've made that was based on a book. Mm -hmm. Um, She had connected with the author of the book, which is the same title, Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. And every year this author, Jean Theo Harris, puts out a Twitter feed on uh, Rosa Parks' birthday. Um, and it's a Twitter feed uh, listing all the things, the facts that you don't know about Rosa yeah. Parks yeah. and that you should. And my and my, uh, my co-director was reading this Twitter feed and was like, whoa, I don't know any of this stuff. This is crazy. And then found out that there had been no, there hadn't been any feature documentary about Rosa Parks. And she was flabbergasted and contacted me and told me that as well. And I was like, really? And I was amazed and intrigued and I read the book. And when I read the book and found out again, all this, you know, this information about Rosa Parks that we, you know, both before and after the the bus boycott that we don't know, even though we know, know her name. So I just thought it was, um, you know, we decided to embark you know, on making this film and just that this was really, you know, time for her story to be told, especially in this time uh, where we are finally kind of uncovering uh, uh, the lives of women in the movement who, you know, have historically either been ignored or, you know, their stories hadn't been told. So we were really excited to bring bring this film to life. Absolutely. We had Jean Theo Harris speak at the festival around 2014, I think it was. Yes, when the book came out. Yes. And it you're right. It was so revelatory. And then the only other thing I remember about her is in the middle of the rape of Reese, Reese Taylor, that that's movie, right. section yep. on her. Exactly. Because and that's people. when I that was my first understanding yeah. of, you know, the breadth of work that Rosa Parks was involved in. When so I want we'll to take a moment now and take a look at that trailer. I felt that I had a message, but people did not choose to listen to what I was saying. We all understand that she sat down on a bus. The narrow narrative of her just on one day did something. Couldn't be further from the truth. She was considered a threat. Espousing radical views. If they could see her talking about the Republic of New Africa, her out there with the Panthers, then they would understand the real Rosa Parks, but they might have been just a little frightened. So Peacock picked up the film before and this one. How did that happen? And uh, how did you secure that? Did you approach them? Did they approach you? What is that? Yeah, so after... after, 
uh, Joanna and I decided uh, we were going to make this this film, and and Jean uh, uh, agreed to you know the option of the book. We uh, connected with Soledad O'Brien's production company. Mm -hmm. um, we had connections there, and you know told them what we were doing, and they were immediately excited to come on as executive producers. Mm -hmm. um, and so after that, we um, pitched to many different places. Um, and uh, so we had a deck, we had a, you know, a sizzle reel and we pitched it and uh, Peacock was the one who- So when uh, you say you pitched it to many different places, you mean distribution companies? Yes, yeah, so uh, streamers, broadcasters, mm -hmm. yes. We pitched it to, to, to them and we were pitching. That was like the, you know, online when everyone's pitching on Zoom. Uh, so we pitched all <laughs> these places. We're doing everything on Zoom, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. And Peacock was the one that, that picked it up. So there are a lot of relatively new streaming platforms out now. I mean, six or seven years ago, nothing. And then since, particularly since the pandemic, lots. So how is it navigating that whole world? And what do you feel are the pros and cons from back when you did theatrical distribution to this now? Easier, harder, more accessible, less? What? Well, I think with the um, with the growth of the streamers, um, you know, one the positive thing is that you have these places looking for more content, right? Mm -hmm. So there's more potentially more opportunity to uh, for filmmakers because yeah. uh, they're looking for content. They are, you know, desperate <laughs> for it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a that can be a good thing for sure. Um, I think that the, the there are drawbacks to it as well. Um, you know, there can be a uh, kind of flattening out of the kind of content they're looking for. For example, like everyone wants true crime because <laughs> wow. that's what people you know, sort of gets really high ratings. So, you know, but a lot of us, you know, don't want to be doing that or mm -hmm. want to be doing, you know, other things besides that. And so that can be an issue. Um, also too, the, uh, the pace in which they want the films can be uh, challenging uh, when you're what making you your- the pace? So, um, they often want these films produced in a very quick manner um, where, and that can be really challenging. I mean, that was challenging with us for, for uh, Rosa Parks. Um, you know, it takes, it, it takes time to figure out a film. It takes time to, to make a, a, a good film, um, mm -hmm. to make a strong film. And, you know, they're on, when, when these streamers are um, commissioning you or, you know, paying, for paying for the film, they can dictate, you know, the timeline in which you make the film. I mean, there's some room for negotiations, but that can be that can be challenging. Yes. And you know, but in terms of theatrical, and of course, everything is sort of shifting and changing. It seems like it's always constantly shifting and changing uh, in this in this distribution landscape. Um, but with theaters, you know, there are some people who um, some filmmakers who are really, you know, want that theatrical experience for their film. Um, uh, you know, I think there's the, the economics of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, um, I, I don't think are necessarily like you can, you know, most people don't, I don't think make, you know, great money on theatrical, um, but people want that, that some filmmakers want that theatrical experience of watching it, you know, with people, of, of it being in a theater. Um, and, you know, you could have that to a certain extent with film festivals, of course, but, you know, that would be one or two times that the film is being shown. Yeah. Um, so. Well, I remember when this new Top Gun came out, it was a big conversation because Tom Cruise refused to stream it. He wanted it in a movie theater. And did you see the film? I did. Not and do you in a remember? Movie theater. Yes, I. You did in a movie theater. No, I did. I, did. Okay. I did in a movie theater, and you know, at the beginning of the film, yeah. he literally comes on and says, like, you know, why it's so important to you know for this film to be in a movie theater. I had never seen that before. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. The only thing close to that I remember was when they would put uh, the piracy announcements on films to right. let people know how folks were losing jobs from piracy. Right, right, yeah. totally. Um, but yeah, so it's all changing. And then of course, some of these streamers have now you know, shut down in terms of documentary films. CNN is not doing uh, out, you know, is not doing um, documentary production um, that they were doing. Um, is it because before. of a glut in the market or? I mean, I, 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 you know, I, it's above my pay grade to, to know. <laughs> uh, I think it is probably an evening uh, sort of a, um, you know, leveling out yeah. uh, of, uh, because there was so much that in the last few years and there were, you know, some films that people were paying like really a gazillion, like a lot of money for documentaries and not sure that was, you know, made sense in terms of the economics of the whole, of the whole thing. Um, but hopefully when, when documentaries were, you only heard or saw about them around the time of the Academy Awards. People yeah. Yeah spending a lot of money on it. It has grown as a field. Absolutely. It's super grown as a field. You know, and I think that has to do, I started seeing that shift um, in kind of the mid 2000s. Mm -hmm. And it was after I had left ABC News and, you know, we started seeing all of these news uh, organizations really cut back on investigative, on international uh, their international bureaus and their investigative bureaus. And I think that documentaries really started to take the place of a lot of that in-depth, um, you know, uh, storytelling, which yeah. you weren't seeing on, on news anymore. I remember, I, I always go back to when um, Fahrenheit 9-11 came out mm -hmm. and uh, Michael Moore's film. And there was at band, there was like a line. Right. Like, uh, at, like and I was like, Oh my gosh! For a documentary like that was to me my that was a turning point. I remember that, and possibly also because of the subject matter. Yes, absolutely. I mean, because and and the news agencies had failed. News organizations had failed in investigating, uh, you know, the the reasons if there was weapons of mass destruction. So yeah, it was for well, sure. That was, that was about the Columbine shooting, right? No, Fahrenheit 9-11 was, uh, was about 9-11. Oh, the okay, okay, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. Columbine came after that. Okay, yeah. you mentioned a term a while back, uh, uh, executive producer. What's the difference between an executive producer and a producer? Well, I mean, it really can depend. You know, you can make these titles, uh, you know, fit to, to the needs. Usually executive producer means either that they are giving money um, and that money could be in terms of, you know, production or in terms of development, helping it, you know, um, get off the ground and then, you know, bringing it to a place that can um, give the production money. Um, sometimes it's just a name that can help with open doors yeah. as well. Um, uh, it, it can also be um, it the place that does the, uh, production, um, you know, that's the production house, right? That has the place where you edit, where you, um, you know, has the, the infrastructure, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was and then a producer. Oh, and then just in terms of producer, a producer is usually uh, much more, you know, is very hands on, is helping kind of in all aspects, everything from like making sure, you know, the film is on budget to um, creatively uh, helping to shape the film, um, doing research. Sometimes they may have to do interviews too. Um, so the producer is like, I mean, it's a, it's a hugely important uh, part of the creative team. Very much so. Uh, years ago, uh, I remember on the music side when uh, NYU started their um, music program, production program, because up until that point, you were either a composer or a musician. And that was the only training you got on university level. And Clive Davis was talking about how important the producer is. And people didn't know what that right. was. Exactly. Well, that's really a good point. So once more, when we're talking about streaming as a filmmaker, when you're going into a negotiation with a streamer, what kinds of things are you looking for 
to include in your deal with them? Well, again, it depends on if this is a um, independent film mm -hmm. um, that you are, you know, have already made and you're selling to them um, or they are funding it from the beginning. Oh, so if they're funding it from the beginning, you have uh, the good part is that you're getting the funding right. because and you don't have to, you know, go to 50 different places, yeah. but they also will have kind of final creative say. So yeah. you have to figure out, you know, if. So are you more of an employee of them on that? Not an employee. No, it's not an employee um, that has different sort of legal terms, but oh, you're yeah. a, um, you're a uh, director for hire in some cases, oh. uh, you know, in this Rosa case, we are bringing the film to them. So it's not like they were going out looking for director, you know, which I've done mm -hmm. that too. Um, so it's a little bit different. Um, but, uh, you know, that's one of the things that you have to, to figure out in terms of the creative, um, you know, what you're willing to let go of in terms of the creative process, yeah. uh, not the creative process in terms of the, the final say, uh, if it's something that they're funding. Now, when you are selling a film that you've already made, or that is mostly made, um, that's different. And you can negotiate terms. You want to figure out what rights you want to keep, mm -hmm. uh, keep hold of. So, um, you know, if it's a uh, Netflix or Hulu or what have you, you know, they'll get the, uh, the U.S. rights, which are kind of the biggest rights. But, you know, if you want to keep the international rights or they are going to get the international rights, uh, uh, you know, and then what that means for you financially, how that's going to affect, you know, what you're being paid, educational rights, mm -hmm. um, if you want to do theatrical, as, as we talked about. So it's really about negotiating what the rights are that you're going to keep as a filmmaker uh, versus um, what they're going to pay you to take. Got it. Okay, so your top three do's and top three don'ts for all of these emerging filmmakers around the process, any aspect of it. So this can be general. Where do people make the most mistakes? Okay. Um, okay. So do's and don'ts. Yes. So the do's, I would say, um, follow your passion. Uh, if you're passionate about a story, um, about um, you know telling a story, um, follow it. Let that guide you. It can really, uh, it, it really can uh, produce uh, uh, resources and um, and you know get other people excited yeah. about your project. So follow your passion. Uh, figure out how you're going to make a living because <laughs> while you're following your passion, you need to get paid and you need to eat. Yeah. So figure that out, um, you know, and that's why I always say, you know, to uh, my my students and other young people, like, you know, if you are interested, if you like editing or if you like uh, being a cinema, you know, shooting, um, you can you can get hired that way. Um, producing, you can get hired as well. Mm -hmm. So figure out how you're going to make, or if you need to have another job, you know, that's outside of the industry as you are, you know, building your career. Um, and then thirdly, I would say um, mentorship is super important as well. So find a mentor, um, someone who you can learn from, who you can help with their projects and learn by doing. This is really a, a an industry where you learn, a profession where you learn by by doing. Uh, and then don't, I would say, don't let the fear consume you. Don't let that little person, that little devil in your head uh, tell you, you know, that you can't do it. Um, so don't let the, let the fear uh, overtake you. Um, don't be afraid of risks, which is the same mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I uh, left ABC and I um, started on a journalism fellowship and I decided not to go back. And that's how I started my first film. And I decided not to go back to ABC because I wanted to uh, really, you know, finish, figure out how to like make this film and to be a documentary filmmaker. And it was very risky. I didn't have a job. Um, so. Uh, so you stocked up on the ramen noodles. and Yes, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so, yeah. So don't be afraid to, ri to take risks. And. Um, Let's see. Um, 
Are there any mistakes people make, students make, or emerging filmmakers make that you've seen? Well, I think that you can, um, if you're making your first film, you really want to find out, um, you want to do your research around what else is out there on the topic. Mm -hmm. um, because it's fine to to do it even if uh, to to do it even if the topic has been done before because your vision is going to be different and but that you got to figure that out you yeah. got to figure out you know what else is out there what else has been done on this topic and how you're going to do it differently and if you don't do that I think I've seen where people uh, can get you know they get, yeah. um, they're not getting the access that they need or they're not getting the, the support mm -hmm. because they're not figuring out how what the film that they are gonna, uh, you know, the film that they are doing is different from what's already out there. Okay, what you working on next? So I am um, working on a film about reparations um, and we're following uh, uh, stories of personal reparations that are happening between descendants of enslavers and descendants of enslaved as the national conversation for reparations moves forward in a really interesting kind of uh, unprecedented way. Mm -hmm. um, so we're starting the edit on that. And then I also have a film about the Wilmington insurrection of 1898, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, the most considered the most successful political insurrection uh, where a um, interracial government, local government in Wilmington, North Carolina, which was a very, um, you know, wealthy uh, or, or um, uh, was a very, uh, had a, a lot of African-American businesses and uh, interracial uh, living happening. Uh, 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 and the, um, the, Blacks, the the Republicans, the who were who were black, and the uh, populace, white farmers, mm -hmm. created an alliance and a government uh, to uh, that was a um, that was challenging the Democratic elite. Who, they were the Democrats at that point, and white supremacists, literally a white supremacist, um, uh, cr uh, created a campaign to take over the government. Uh, where you know black people were in positions of power, take over the government, um, and take back these positions, and then uh, had a massacre where they wow. ran African Americans out of the city um, and uh, and killed them, mm -hmm. and it was and then instituted uh, voter you know suppression so black people could not vote, um, you know as we know that story, mm -hmm. and there wasn't a. <clears throat> There was not a elected official from North Carolina, a black elected official from North Carolina, um, you know, until like the 1990s or something. Yeah. Um, so it was the end of Re Reconstruction um, and the beginning of you know uh, segregation that was and 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 other cities like uh, the, where they had these insurrections or where they had these massacres really looked at Wilmington as a model. There is so much in the history of African-Americans in this country that is ripe for many of these stories. Oh gosh, I know, I yeah. know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and not just documentary. I mean, there's some, you know, especially because, you know, there's not archive or we don't have, um, you know, there's so many r stories that are ripe for fiction treatments, Absolutely. you know, of, of our history. I mean, it's, yeah, it's kind of incredible when you think about it. Well, thank you so much for joining us on Minding Your Movie Business. And everyone, don't forget, you can see The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks on Peacock. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Next month on April 20th, our next Minding Your Movie Business workshop topic is New Trends in the Film Business. Los Angeles entertainment attorney Craig Emanuel will be your host. Visit our website at www.mowff.org for more details. So happy you joined us. I'm Isisara Bay. March on.